you are again in front of the television. With it, you can be anywhere in the world. Deep in its oceans, even out in space. You can make music, take a fast break, and even learn something. Sometimes we take the products of planet Earth for granted. Everyone uses them, but most can't tell you what these products are made of. How they were made or where they came from. <laughs> Toothpaste, cosmetics, appliances, and the electricity that burns them, even the clothes we wear, are mineral products. Imagine a day when you wake up and one by one, all of the mineral products in your life just disappear. There wouldn't be much to see. And there wouldn't be TV. It takes 35 different minerals and elements just to make the set. So the next time there's nothing on the tube, remember what's inside it and where it came from. Virtually any product or machine we can conceive, invent, or use comes from combinations of the many minerals found below the Earth's surface. And these minerals are our natural resources, existing in limited supply on and under the surface of our planet. And now we are realizing more and more that these natural resources and the environment around them must be protected and conserved. Just like the air that we breathe, the water that all life depends upon, and the land that feeds the world's creatures. Well, Barty, you ready to go to work? Good boy. Here we go. Colorado Springs and was fortunate enough to have a family where during the summer weekends and fall weekends we would go to a number of old Colorado historic mining towns and um, I think I got gold fever when I was about 11 years old and often through high school would write reports on gold mining and even through college. I think with the population increasing the way it is uh, all of us have to learn to be recyclers. We have to uh, to uh, compromise our use with some things. Remember, miners are only responding to markets. We're only responding to a public that was wanting uh, automobiles with uh, zinc bumpers. Uh, they were mining lead so we could have batteries to start our cars. We were mining iron ore so we could build automobiles and uh, buildings. And so miners are only responding to a market. No matter who you are, or where you came from, billions of us are consumers of the Earth's precious minerals. Almost everything we use each day is made up of combinations of different minerals and elements. Skateboards, sidewalks, roads, and cars. Even something as simple and ordinary as brushing our teeth. We wouldn't have toothpaste without first mining the minerals barite, calcite, fluorspar, quartz, and sodium carbonate. The picture you're watching, like your favorite television program, was shot on film. Film containing silver. And before any film for a movie or television show can be shot, processed, or transferred to videotape, the silver must be mined. Videotape is a mineral product too, manufactured with plastic tape and magnetic particles made of iron. Consider the mineral products it takes to make a computer. It takes more than 32 elements from A to Z, made from minerals mined all over the world to put the simplest computer online. 
Without gold, for example, the microelectronic revolution would not have been possible. The flawless signal transmission we enjoy depends on hair-thin gold wires that connect microcircuits to tiny gold contacts. It's overwhelming to think of just how many products are made from the rocks and minerals of our planet. Some minerals we use were formed by the remains of millions of ocean animals from long ago, when much of the Earth was covered by water. Now inland and far above sea level, these deposits of limestone and shale provide us with cement for concrete and transportation systems. Other mineral deposits from these ancient seas give us phosphates for the fertilizers we need for food production. Even the chalk we use in our schools was formed on the floors of these ancient seas. Earth is equipped with a powerful internal heat machine that makes mountains and volcanoes and causes earthquakes. In a dramatic but slow process, sometimes taking millions of years, mountain ranges are forced up, changing the landscape and modifying the Earth's outer layer, its crust. Meanwhile, the Earth's surface was and is constantly exposed to external forces like winds and rains, which also alter the Earth's outer layer. This modified crust can be rich with mineral deposits. The more we know about how minerals are formed, the better we are able to mine current mineral deposits and to discover new ones. Geologists are challenged with the task of finding these rare and scattered deposits. Modern exploration tools such as satellite photos and computer images enable them to examine vast tracts of land without disturbing the Earth's surface. With this technology and a little luck, the geologists might discover a prospect or two, sort of like finding a needle in nature's haystack. Through further sampling and study, the miners hope the prospects will prove to be rich enough to risk the development of a mine. When that happens, it's a rare and wonderful event for mining companies, large and small. Traditionally, in a small operation, uh, a person like myself, who may be president of the company, is uh, one day with a suit and tie on, several days uh, uh, actually mining or uh, hauling the trash down to the dump or taking the water samples. Historically, it's been the small miner who always makes initial discovery and then interests a bigger company who comes in and makes a mine out of it. All I can say is that uh, uh, I think we're just one round away from the mother load. Hopefully. Considering all of the minerals used by billions of consumers, it's amazing that more than 99.9% .9 of the Earth's surface has never been touched by mining. For example, most of the gold we use comes from relatively small areas in South Africa, Canada, the United States, Russia, Australia, and Indonesia. Copper, which conducts electricity and is an important part of the communication systems that connect the world, is mined from deposits mostly in the United States, Chile, Canada, Russia, and Zambia. And aluminum, processed from the rock bauxite and used for making lightweight, durable material for a wide variety of products from soda pop cans to airplanes, is mined mostly in Australia, Guinea, Jamaica, and Brazil. Throughout history, people have turned to mineral products to make a better life. During the Stone Age, our ancestors recorded this marvelous history using minerals to make long-lasting, colorful paints. Hematite was used to make African ritual paint as far back as 41,000 B.C. And Native Americans used the minerals cinnabar and carnitite for their ceremonial makeup. Weapons and farming implements distinguished man as protector and provider. Flint spearheads dating back to 18,000 B.C. were found in France and Spain, and similar weapons were used by Stone Age inhabitants of North America thousands of miles and an ocean away. As early as 4200 B.C., people had discovered that fire could be used to melt copper, allowing it to be molded into many shapes and forms. 
people of the Copper Age found this metal to be perfect for shaping into ornaments and useful tools. The Egyptians were early copper miners, and at about 3200 BC, learned to mix copper with tin to create the metal alloy bronze. Bronze was easier to melt and stronger than copper. The Bronze Age in both the Old World and the New provided tools strong enough to help build giant monuments and as in the case of the early Incans, tools delicate enough to perform surgeries. However, widespread use of iron and the manufacture of iron tools occurred around 1100 BC. In the 18th century, iron was alloyed with coke, a byproduct of coal, creating the first steel. The mining and mixing of minerals opened doors to the ages of exploration, reason, science, industry, and technology. Because of their beauty and scarcity, certain minerals have been used throughout history in the same way we use money today. From the turquoise and malachite traded by Native Americans, to the gold and silver that makes coins and still sets economic standards of governments in the 20th century, man has always recognized the value of our mineral resources. Through the ages, people have explored and harvested the earth as if its boundaries were endless. Royalty and common people, natives and explorers, gave little or no thought to earth as a limited supplier to man. As the human population increased, Many saw animal populations and natural resources decreasing, changing the way we think about our planet, ultimately changing the way we use and manage the Earth's valuable resources. Ten years ago, I wasn't as up on you know, taking care of the forests and the oceans as I am today. I think there's more of an awareness that's starting right now and from elementary school on up with the adults. Stop littering. I used to litter a lot. <laughs> well, they realize that um, little by little, the 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 resource of the planet are getting smaller and smaller, like the forest and everything. So they have to be careful and try to do something about it, like recycling, for example. The methods of mining worldwide have also changed significantly in recent years in order to manage the balance between limited supply, the environment and increasing demand by all of us as consumers. Miners, like many of us, have become more sensitive to maintaining that balance, more actively protecting the environment which supplies the world's mineral demands. Like water, for a start off, if it's going to affect the water, uh, the groundwater, then obviously that would be a, a major concern, the vegetation, obviously, because we're all concerned about that, and. Uh, and plant a tree and everything. And if it's not dangerous to my health or to the health of other people, I don't see any reason. It might bring jobs to people around here. And I don't see any, any problem. The discovery of a major gold deposit in the vicinity of Lower Lakes, California, meant drastic changes for that community. As one of the largest construction projects in the state of California at that time, the mine brought jobs and prosperity into a depressed economy. For the people living there, a large mine also meant fear of the unknown and awakened concern for the environment. The tailings will be uh, deposited from a ring discharge system so that we can take advantage of the uh, natural evaporation of the area and accelerate the consolidation of the solids and get in here and reclaim it as quickly as we possibly can. There was certainly a great deal of curiosity from the community as to how we might affect uh, water quality and air quality and, and the interests of surrounding landowners. We worked very closely with them. We sought out all of those people who had an interest at stake and encouraged them to participate in our planning process. Before one stone is turned on a new mine site, a long list of environmental requirements must be fulfilled by the mine developers. In the case of the McLaughlin mine and other modern mines like it, over 50 federal laws protect air, water, wildlife, vegetation, historical sites, and the communities surrounding a potential mine site. In addition, 
Numerous state and local regulations and laws must be followed. These regulations result in hundreds of permits that must be obtained to meet today's strict standards. I think we've discovered in, in the last uh, really 15 or 20 years in modern mining projects that it is indeed possible to produce the minerals that we need as a society uh, in an environmentally acceptable way. Uh, McLaughlin is but one example of, of a mine where water quality is protected and air quality is protected and really the surrounding environment is enhanced as a consequence of the presence of the mining project in that location. At and around modern mine sites, water samples are taken from both ground and surface water monitoring stations. The samples are then analyzed at independent labs and as in other mining operations, the results become public record. Stone quarries provide towns and cities with the construction materials needed for roads and buildings, so they're usually located near the population centers that they supply. During the last 15 years, as the quarry has grown and the metropolitan area has grown, the citizens have become more aware of mining operations close to them. We realize that it's very important for us as good citizens that if we want to grow and expand, that we have to be cognizant of our neighbors to the east who do see this quarry and who are impacted by it. Because quarries are so close to where people live, it's especially important to provide barriers against noise pollution and to continue to replace mined land with cultural resources for humans and other inhabitants to enjoy. <laughs> mine. <laughs> they go into the ground and dig stuff. I don't know. Some people have a perception that we go in with a little pick and we pick out, uh, we put a little canvas down and every day we pick out a couple ounces of gold. We bring it out and put it in a little furnace and we take it down to the jewelry store and sell it. And uh, that's certainly exactly opposite of what it really is. Modern mining has evolved into a high-tech, more environmentally conscious supplier to the world's consumers. Different types of ore deposits require different mining techniques to extract the minerals. Rich, heavily concentrated deposits deep below the ground surface are often mined underground. In an underground mine, miners travel through a shaft similar to an elevator or a horizontal opening called an adit down to the face of the deposit, using highly advanced machinery to mine the lead, zinc, silver, diamonds, or other minerals commonly found in this type of ore deposit. When the mineral deposit is large and close to the surface, it is recovered by using one of several surface mining techniques. Normally, the minerals in these deposits, such as copper, are less concentrated, and large amounts must be processed to extract them. Digging their way down into the deposit in stair-step fashion to create benches, the miners operate some of the largest machines on Earth. Giant shovels and trucks to break up the rock and haul it up out of the open pit. As tall as a two-story house, one of the largest of these trucks weighs as much as six 737 jets. A mineral deposit that occurs as a flat layer close to the surface is recovered by area mining. Coal deposits are often layered this way, and the miners temporarily open the earth to remove the minerals beneath. Then the top layer is replaced, and the land is reclaimed to its previous state. Well, I guess my, uh, my perception of miners comes from uh, uh, what you see in the movies, uh, guys with hard hats and, and lights on their heads, dressed in overalls. No, no way. There is no way that you'd get me in a coal mine. Stuart McGee is a history professor who has studied the coal industry, charting its past, present, and future. All throughout American history and culture, all of our images of coal are consistently and unrelentingly negative. Acid rain, strip mining, black lung, labor strife, accidents, sallow-faced, toe-headed children standing knee-deep in garbage-infested hollows next to tar paper shacks. These are the images I brought with me to the coal fields. The people who grew up in those coal communities don't remember it that way at all. They speak fondly of the sense of community, neighborhood, the close ties of church and family. 
It took me years of study before I could free myself of all of the misconceptions and stereotypes that hinder our understanding of the peculiar and fascinating world of the coal fields. A coal miner worked with his hands in the soil. He produced a finished product. He got up in the morning, and like a farmer, he walked to work. At the end of the day, he produced a finished product that he could take pride in. The mining industry is often singled out for environmental infractions, and in fact, all modern industry does change the land in which we live. However, industrialization occurred in the late 19th century before we understood the implications really of the process. Too often, we tend to superimpose the present upon the past. We are fortunate today that we understand the implications and we've begun to deal with these problems in a way that I think we can all take some pride in. We should not forget, however, that all of our fossil fuels are finite and only the proper management and the proper control and use of these industries can enable us to enjoy the benefits of cheap and efficient energy in the years to come. Some of us, however, still miss the braying of mine mules and the, the echoing of the immigrant miners' foreign languages up and down the haulage ways and the passageways of the coal mines of yesterday. Over half of the world's electricity is generated by coal, and in many areas, coal mining is still a way of life. Well, the general public has misconception to, and the stereotype that all miners are illiterate and uh, they're dirty-faced, bearded, and pot bellies, and which nothing. These are a bunch of highly professional, highly trained, very dedicated individuals that have a job to perform and they do it uh, remarkably. And uh, as far as being a dirty job, I'm a truck driver here at O'Hickory, and I've done put in a half shift's work, and I'm not black, dirty, or have a black face. And my clothes are still clean. Are you happy? I'm happy. <laughs> the best thing I like about it is just to come down here and send them in every day. It's just like being home to me. It's uh, just a skill that has to be done, and it's a job that has to be done. Uh, it's no different than being home to me. When they come in and reclaim it, sow it back down in grass, trees, shrubbery and stuff like that, uh, it's no different, it's beautiful, I love it out here. Reclamation? No. You gonna tell me? No. <laughs> Reclamation? No. no, I don't even know how to spell it, I mean, I really don't know. Reclamation, to return the land to a useful or better condition. Modern coal mining is a temporary use of the land. After mining is completed, when the land is reclaimed, it's hard to tell the mine site ever existed. Bill Agnew has been the reclamation specialist at a modern coal mine in Colorado for the last six years. He's witnessed firsthand the public's increasing concern and resulting care for our limited resources. And he's seen how changing attitudes can make a big difference. Through good conservation practice and good common sense and, and working with the state and federal agencies, people that really know what's going on, then I think just about any mine site you can have some real positive impacts. And oftentimes you can make it better. There didn't used to be any antelope. Now we have a population over 300 antelope that, uh, that inhabit the mine site. This area on the mine site is critical deer and elk winter range here. And early on in the mining project, there was a lot of concern about, about the mine and, and the disturbance to those populations of animals. So in cooperation with the Colorado Division of Wildlife and the Colorado Mine Line Reclamation Division, we came up with an excellent plan in order to, uh, to provide a better wildlife habitat than what we had before it was mined. Deer, for example, in order to graze an area, they have to feel fairly secure. And by establishing things like mature shrub clumps, as on our mine site, you'll see that uh, the animals can utilize that, and they'll feel really safe and comfortable on the, on the mine site. Changes to the land are inevitable, simply by our being here, by our towns and cities, our highways, even our recreation areas. At reclamation sites and mines worldwide, in business and industry and at home, people are taking responsibility for better resource use and management. Recycling, I would say that's taking the material you're done with and reusing it again. You take like a can of soda, you can use it over so you can help the environment. Mining and refining techniques are constantly being improved to make sure no minerals go to waste. Our company is in the business of remining. 
we work old mining dumps, old mill tailings that have already been mined once by previous operations. A lot of this material still has gold and silver value left in it. It's material that wasn't economical to process at the time, so it was cast aside into most of these dumps. At today's prices, it's very economical to go back. So there's the added bonus of being able to mine it and recover the gold and the silver and some secondary minerals. It's actually a recycling process. We look for opportunities where, first of all, there's a resource, there's something that we can go after and mine and make a profit, but also there's an opportunity to do an environmental restoration project and help to restore the land back to a healthy environment. Miners, like most of us, have come a long way in conserving our resources. In today's mines, the processing solution which separates gold ore is used over and over again, just like you may reuse aluminum foil instead of throwing it away. It's simple, really. A growing population demands more minerals, so it's vital that we manage our resources carefully. The better we use them, the better off we'll be. On Earth, there are no unlimited resources. There's only so much land, so much air, so much water, and so many minerals. We understand that the Earth's mineral resources provide us with all the conveniences and technologies of modern living, and that these mineral resources are limited in supply. And with that understanding must come a concern and an active role in carefully developing and wisely using these resources. Responsible miners must mine responsibly. Responsible consumers must consume responsibly. If we work together, we can protect and manage the resources of this common ground. <laughs>